This is the Proton Guru video practice for topics 3.9 and 10. These problems will give you practice on ozonolysis, preparation of vicinal diols, and the hydroboration oxidation of alkenes. At the end of the video, there's also a good deal of practice on other alkene reactions we've seen so far. Some brief and straightforward reading to get you ready for these kinds of problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 1 Primer 2018. You can also find additional chemistry videos and information on how to match those videos up to your particular course's textbook at protonguru.com. Our first question asks us to provide major products for these reactions, and we look at these reaction conditions and try to figure out what type of reaction we have. One point is that the benzene rings, or arenes, do not react like the regular alkenes, so we're really trying to do reactions of these particular bonds in these two cases. If we look at this first reaction in step one, we see something with a BH bond, whether that's listed as BH3 or B2H6, or an H on a boron with two R groups, we see a BH bond and we think this is going to be a hydroboration oxidation. That reaction proceeds with addition of an OH and an H with thin addition. This reaction also exhibits anti-Markovnikov regioselectivity. And one way you can tell that you're going to have an anti-Markovnikov reaction for the common addition reactions to alkenes is that you have hydrogen peroxide. Once we know that we're going to add an O, to the less substituted side because it's anti-Markovnikov, and an H to the more substituted. So we add the H, add the OH, add them sin to one another. So I've just started off drawing them as wedges. We now check the stereochemistry, see if we have generated chiral centers. And of course, we've generated two chiral centers, one here and one here. And our starting material was a chiral. So we'll have to produce the enantiomer of the structure drawn as well in an equal quantity, and that is a racemic mixture. In this second reaction, well, as soon as you see that osmium, you know that you're going to add an OH to each of the two carbons with syn addition. Check for some chiral centers. We've generated two, so we must produce the compound drawn as well as its enantiomer in equal quantities, so we get a racemic mixture. Now, a challenging... So here's a problem with all the types of reactions where you can put OH groups on the alkene. Here is the hydroboration oxidation that we're talking about in the current topics. You should add the H to the more substituted, the OH to the less substituted to represent the anti-Markovnikov regioselectivity. Checking for stereochemistry, we haven't generated any chiral centers, so we don't need to worry about drawing any other isomers. Second problem, we see osmium. We know that we're going to end up getting rid of the double bond and adding an OH to each side. And in this case, we do generate a chiral center, so we'd have a 50-50 mixture of the R and S isomers. We'd have a racemic mixture. In this case, we have the mercury, and that cues us into the fact that we're trying to do a Markovnikov addition of an H and an OH. It's a mix of syn and anti-addition that you'll have to worry about in cases where that matters. But when we see that, we should put an OH here and an H here in place of the double bond. We see that we would generate a chiral center by doing that. So it makes sense that we get a racemic mixture, half R and half S isomer at that carbon. When we see these conditions, conditions for the hydration reaction, we hopefully recognize that a strong acid with an alkene will lead to the formation of a carbocation. And you want to make the more stable carbocation initially. You've always got to check to see whether that carbocation rearranges. Here we see a more substituted carbon right beside it. So one of these methyl groups with its two electrons will move over there. Positive charge has migrated to become tertiary now. The OH part of the water will do the coordination to add the OH group. And that will lead to the formation of this alcohol. And now you can see why we need all four of these reactions, even though each of these is a way to put an OH on across a CC double bond. They all produce different products from one another. The final reaction we'll talk about in this video is ozonolysis. Now ozone is O3, and this reaction differentiates itself from all the other reactions we talk about with alkenes, because you actually cut the carbon-carbon double bond when you see ozone, and you put a double bond O in place of the double bond C. So this bond would break, and each of those two fragments would make a double bond to O, where there used to be a double bond to a carbon. The other thing to look out for is that some books and some courses require you to know two different workup procedures as the second step of ozonolysis. If you see DMS, which stands for dimethyl sulfide, or if you see zinc with acid or water, you don't have to worry about changing the H's on the carbon-carbon double bond. But if your course is one that uses hydrogen peroxide as a second step to work it up, all the hydrogens attached to the carbon-carbon double bond, just that one, will become OHs because this is an oxidizing workup condition. So if we're thinking about this on our scratch paper, we look at this first example. We say, well, we're going to cut the carbon-carbon double bond and make these two fragments. If I'm looking on 
the second case, ozone. So I'll take that fragment wherever there was a double bond to a carbon, I'll make a double bond to an O. And then because I have the hydrogen peroxide workup, I'll have to worry about this H becoming an OH. So I'd expect to see those products for this ozonolysis reaction. Now we're asked to provide the missing reactants, reagents, and products. A good first step is to think about what each of these reactions will do. For example, this set of conditions is an oxidation reaction of alcohols. So you will think that in the starting material, I would have to have alcohols here that could be oxidized to become those carbonyl species. So some type of alcohol will be here, and you'll need some molecule that has two alcohols since you end up with two carbonyl. In contrast, the ozonolysis has to start with an alkene, and you'll break the alkene up to make two carbonyls. So you might envision the starting material will be some type of alkene that's linked together by a chain because the target has two carbon-oxygen double bonds linked by a chain. So let's consider those two cases more carefully. What type of alcohol can be oxidized to give a ketone? Well, you'd have to have an alcohol there. Then I have one, two, three, four carbons that don't have alcohols on them. And then we have this carbon. I'm going to highlight here. We end up with three bonds from carbon to oxygen. Well, we have to start off with an alcohol for the oxidation reaction to work. And we need two hydrogens so that we can make the two new bonds to oxygen. How about this ozonolysis where we determined we needed an alkene linked by a chain? Well, we have to think about this. The total number of carbons that are going to be in between the two double bonded carbons will tell us what size of ring we have. Well, we have two carbons that are in the double bonds that will become doubly bound to oxygen. In between, we have one, two, three, four additional. One, two, three, four additional. One, two, three, four additional carbon. It's carbons A and B that end up being cut apart to form the new carbon-oxygen double bonds. In addition, there's a methyl group on carbon A. We better fill that in. So if I draw these out more neatly and number them, you can get a good feel for how these molecules match up with one another. And now we go to this last case. We're doing an ozonolysis. Well, if there are several CC double bonds, they should all be broken apart. And you'll make a bond to oxygen here, a bond to oxygen here, 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 here. We're going to break this molecule into several fragments. This top piece, we've broken into a fragment like this. This second step does not change this H into an OH, so it's going to stay just how it was to start. Now, if we look at this piece over here, I'm going to make the double bond O from that bond as well. And then it goes down to this bottom fragment. So this bottom fragment is going to break apart as well. So if we map the pieces, after going through that analysis, these three carbons are these three carbons down here. And then if we take a look at this piece here that's been cut out, that's this piece here. You can see if you circle it without the double bond oxygens, you can see that this framework. And then this piece came from this piece. Finally, we ought to be able to look at all these reaction conditions and figure out what the major products should be. So let's do that one reaction at a time. When you see the osmium, you should think that you're going to add an OH to each of the two carbons. And that is one of the reactions that undergoes syn addition. If you look at that, you'll have generated two stereocenters. So when you draw your product, make sure your two OHs are syn to each other and make sure you indicate that that's a racemic mixture. Looking at reaction B, you see a halogen. Oh, the halogens are the ones that give us anti-addition. Better note that down. And this other reactant is also a nucleophile. So anti, the halogen adds the bromine. Water as a nucleophile provides an OH. So we're going to make sure that we have Markovnikov addition, OH on the more substituted, Br on the less substituted carbon, that they're anti to each other. We carefully note that we've generated these two chiral centers. So we're going to get a racemic mixture because our starting material was not chiral. Next, we have D2 and palladium. Well, D2 is deuterium, should react just like hydrogen. So if that was a hydrogenation, we would have two hydrogens added and add two deuterium atoms, syn to one another. That generates chiral centers as well, just like our first two reactions. We'll have to make a racemic mixture. Reaction condition D is one of the anti-Markovnikov steps. So you're going to add the OH, to the less substituted side, the H to the more substituted side, and the two things that add have to be syn to one another. So if you draw out your product and carefully note that you've made some stereocenters, you'll know you have to make a racemic mixture. If we look at reaction E, well, we have the halogen. And when we see the halogen, we should say, well, we're going to have anti-addition. And we only have one nucleophilic species, the Br2, so we're going to add two bromines. If we're looking on scratch paper, we'd say, oh, we add the bromines 
here and here. Make sure one's away and one's towards to represent the anti-stereochemistry. We've generated chiral centers, so we're going to get a racemic mixture. If we look at condition F, as soon as we see that mercury, we know it's an oxymercuration demercuration, where all we do is add an OH to the more substituted side and H to the less substituted side. There aren't any chiral centers, so we don't need to indicate anything about chirality. If we see MCPBA, that's an epoxidation reagent. We could scribble out the double bond, say, okay, we're going to make an epoxide. That will lead to a stereocenter. We'll have a racemic mixture. Reaction condition H, we have to be careful. We see a strong acid. We know that we're going to make the more substituted carbocation. In this case, though, it's tertiary. It's not going to be able to rearrange. So once we know that's the carbocation we're dealing with, the water just supplies an OH to wherever that site was. So we're going to get this product. And that's the same product in this case as what we had for reaction F. It's not chiral. Finally, reaction I is an ozonolysis. And the second step tells us that any H's on the alkene carbons, the double bond carbons, will be turned into OH's. So if I'm looking on my scratch paper, I say, okay, I'm going to break this in half. There'll be an O there and an O there. It's a little hard to draw those in that cramped space, but there'll be an OH here. And in between the double bond O's, you have one, two, three carbons. So if you were to draw this out, you have one, two, three carbons. The carbon beside carbon one has a methyl group on it. It's indicated there. Two, three. Carbon number four, if we keep numbering, is the one that had the H, but that got oxidized to the OH because our hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizing agent. Perhaps a more challenging question is one where you're given both the starting material in the center of this wheel and the products, and you're asked to fill in these reaction conditions. This is a challenging question. This is a great practice for this video. You could pause it and try to figure this out. It's also a good application of flashcards to study for a class. So as you look through these, some of them will be easier to identify than others. For example, reaction A, you're adding two OH groups. You say, well, it's that osmium tetroxide reaction that's the only one that adds two OH groups. If you look at B and figure out what you're adding, you say, well, I add a bromine and an OH. So I need both the halogen and water. That's the halohydrin reaction. Well, now let's look at reaction C. We can tell that we've had to make some new carbon-oxygen double bonds. So we should think about ozonolysis. We also see that we've introduced OH groups where there used to be just hydrogens in the starting material. So we need the ozonolysis to make the CO double bonds, and we need the hydrogen peroxide to undertake the oxidation to form those OH groups. Looking at reaction D, we can see that we've added an OH, but the OH is added to the less substituted carbon over here, and we've added a hydrogen to the more substituted carbon. So we have anti-Markovnikov addition, of an OH and an H. The only conditions we know that facilitate that reaction is the hydroboration oxidation reaction. Reaction E leads to the addition of a bromine to each of the two carbons, so we need bromine. And you might have chosen a different solvent. You could choose CH2Cl2 like I did here, or CHCl3, that's chloroform, or CCl4, all common solvents. You could have even left the solvent off and that'd be okay. You don't want to put water here though. Remember that if you have bromine and water, you actually add an OH in a bromine. So just be careful about that. If we move on to reaction F, we see that we have Markovnikov addition of an OH and an H that's not drawn. Now we actually know two reactions that can facilitate Markovnikov addition of an OH and an H. We have the oxymercuration demercuration, which uses the mercury reagent, or we have the reaction that uses a strong acid with water as a nucleophile. So to figure out which one of these is happening here, we would think about the mercuration first. That would lead to this product. But would the hydration conditions also lead to that product? We should check that to see if there is more than one possible answer. Remember, you make a carbocation when you have a strong acid reacting with an alkene. In this case, the secondary carbocation would rearrange so the positive charge would actually end up on the tertiary carbon where it's more stable. That means that the OH would then end up wherever the positive charge was, and that's a different product than what we see here for reaction F. So reaction F should be the oxymercuration demercuration. If we look at reaction G, we see that what we've done is made an epoxide ring where the double bond used to be. We need some sort of epoxidation conditions. So you could use any of these three. Now this next step, you see the OH has added to this carbon, where there used to be a hydrogen. But we know that reactions of alkenes generally add units to the double bond. So if you see a unit added to a site 
where there wasn't a double bond before, you know there was a carbocation rearrangement that took place. And we talked about this a few minutes ago. This is the hydration reaction using sulfuric acid in water or phosphoric acid in water would also work. Finally, reaction I, we see that we make a cyclopropane where a CH2 unit has added. Either of these two conditions would be appropriate to add the CH2 unit in a cyclopropanation step.